Hello, and welcome to EDH Rec's Upping the Average, where we take a Commander's Average deck list as compiled by the data on EDH Rec and make some quick swaps to it to help take it from a good start to a great one. This week, I hope you'll join me for a discussion of the one, the only, the great Catsby. Jetmere Nexus of Revels is freaking ridiculous. With three creatures, we get a boost in Vigilance. With six, we get another boost and Trample. With nine, we get another another boost and Double Strike. This card's terrifying. Jetmere is the runaway favorite commander from Nuka Pena, currently commanding over 700 decks and full to the brim with the most famous token-making cards in Naya Colors to help it hit that creature threshold as quickly as possible. We've no time to waste, the party's about to start. Let's grab Jetmere's decklist from the Average Deck feature and import it to the Architect deck building website. As always, remember that any swaps we make must either keep the total price of the list cost neutral or else help lower the overall price of the deck. What a prestigious party! Look at these guests! It looks like everyone's invitation said to bring a plus one, or in some cases, a plus three, or a plus five. To be honest, Jetmere actually kind of strikes me as a quintessential Naya commander, or I suppose Cabaretti commander. A lot of other Naya decks have a very strong thematic leaning. Gishoth caring about dinosaurs, Obun caring about landfall, Marisi with Goad, Rin and Siri being a tribal deck, that kind of thing. But Jetmere really provides a baseline to just play the best of the best. I normally do a brief breakdown on a deck's core cards, but for this commander, I think the most important thing to do will be to highlight the play pattern of Jetmere himself. So Jetmere, this ability is bonkers. It might be egregious to say that this is a Craterhoof Behemoth in the command zone or an overwhelming stampede in the command zone, but effectively, that is the play pattern that this deck pretty naturally adopts. Make eight or more tokens, then slam Jetmere into play and attack with a minimum of like 64 trampling damage. Even assuming that we just had one ones, that's eight four one trampling double strikers. The damage output from Jetmere is exponential when it hits that third threshold. When this guy comes down, he most likely KOs two players. This guy's the truth. However, this has massive side effects on the deck's construction. For example, instant speed token creation is our favorite thing in the entire world. Make a bunch of tokens on the end step before our turn, then untap and immediately slam Jetmere, surprise damage out of nowhere. And this is much more valuable than creating a bunch of tokens on our own turn and then waiting a full round before we can play our commander and clock the table. Making tokens on our own turn leaves them open to removal and board wipes, which we really want to avoid, so this skews us in favor of stuff that makes tokens at instant speed. And also, making tokens mid-combat definitely helps this along as well, especially when those tokens come in already attacking so that they will immediately benefit from the buff and from the trample and from the double strike. Now, of course, there are still some cards that make so many tokens that we don't mind that they operate at sorcery speed, or they'll take a few turns to swarm the board, but that's still definitely okay, because if they are allowed to live, our commander will take over the entire game. Note too the absence of famous draw spells in this deck, like Rishkar's Expertise or Return of the Wildspeaker, which draw based on the power of our biggest creature. Jetmere's got five power, so normally we would love these kind of effects, but the pattern of this deck is such that we tend to play Jetmere last. He's the finisher, so we actually want to avoid the typical power-based draw since we usually just have a bunch of 1-1s, and instead we'll look to other sources of card advantage, because Jetmere will hopefully be the last thing we play. There's also some funky stuff happening with the ramp in this deck. This average list contains a surplus of mana dorks, and the reason why is obvious. These count toward Jetmere's total, so sweet, bonus mana and bonus creature count, awesome. But it also indicates to us the speed at which this deck wants to operate. Mana dorks means we're going pretty fast here. We're not waiting around. Then again, though, this deck does contain some famous landfall cards too, so we do have some long-term punchiness if our initial burst doesn't work out. In fact, quick sidebar, if I was personally building Jetmere for myself, I would honestly deviate a bit from what we see in the average deck, and I would, I think, want to go a lot harder into the landfall and the lands matter theme for this deck. And frankly, there are a bunch of different ways that you could build this commander. Maybe you want it to be cat tribal, or maybe even demon tribal. My point is, I think I'm going to use this as an excuse to remind folks out there about one of the most important tools on EDH Rec, the advanced filters. If the most common build path isn't the path that you want to take, 
Use those filters. When there are cards that you know you want to use or cards that you know you don't want to use, use the advanced filters to tailor the recommendations more closely to your needs. I promise, if you haven't been using these yet, they're a total game changer. They are my favorite thing about EDH Rec. Use them, use them, use them. Anyway, back to Jetmere. This starting list is a banger, but there are tweaks to make, and I'll tackle them in two categories. First, we'll live it up as the life of the party, making our regular swaps for fun party favors, but then I'll also adjust for a more budget-friendly list in part two. For now, let's kick things off and get this party started. You know, it was one thing when the D&D set came out and it didn't contain the party mechanic, but now we've got Jetmir, the nexus of Revels, who parties so hard that it crushes all of our enemies, and he also doesn't have the party mechanic, and I'm, I don't know, I'm just a little sad about it. First things first, 33 lands just feels too low for a deck that contains landfall cards. Our land drops just need to be a little bit more consistent than this, and a few more lands will help out the occasional Scoot Swarm drop, you know? I know that these cards come in tapped, but I still think that Colony Garden and Cross and Verge are totally worth it. One comes with a body, which Jetmere adores and which our token doublers could take advantage of, and Crows and Verge fixes colors by fetching dual-typed lands. And honestly, frankly, I look for any and all reasons to play Crows and Verge whenever I can. Watsi, please finish the Crows and Verge cycle for me someday, I beg of you. As exchange for this though, I am going to cut one piece of ramp from the deck, Selesnia Signet. I just don't think we actually need it. We have 15 other pieces of ramp in the deck already, and those cards all color fix a little bit nicer, or find lands to help the occasional landfall trigger, or they're creatures that Jetmere can pump up, so this Signet just happens to be lowest on that ladder. Speaking of lands, though, there are two land-related cards here that I don't think make the cut for Jetmere. Rampaging Baloths and Dragonmaster Outcast failed to really impress me. In a dedicated landfall deck, Baloths does amazing work, but Jetmere doesn't really care about the size of the tokens all that much. This deck cares about quantity first and foremost, so a six-mana card has to make a lot of tokens to really pull its weight here. The Outcast, meanwhile, is only one mana, but its output is even slower, and we're just not about that at all. Don't worry, I'm replacing these with other token makers, but I'll get to those in a bit. I also regrettably have to nix the Assemble the Legion in the deck, too. I know, I want to like this card so much, and I do think it almost gets there, but it's just too slow. If you love this card and want to play it because of that, I really can't blame you. I love it too. But it's just a time investment that I wasn't confident that this deck really vibed with at the end of the day. Oh, and uh, Ginny Faye, let's talk. I know she's Jetmere second, but Jetmere doesn't really need her? Ginny is her own cool commander deck in her own right. But again, this just isn't a deck that cares about the shape of our tokens, just the number of them. So we'll want more token makers instead of token modifiers. There's a bit more to go, but I want to take a brief pause here and remember to amp up this deck's card advantage. There's a fine amount here, but this deck really runs the risk of running out of steam if we're not careful. So I know it's basic, but a simple harmonize will just really help us out here. And given how many ways we have to make tokens on each player's turn, I also think a welcoming vampire would be a good investment too. All right, now let's get to the heavy hitters. These are some of the more complicated cuts, so bear with me for a moment. Lightning Greaves, you're up. The goal on this card is good. Protect Jetmere. If Jetmere dies, we lose the whole buff. However, that's kind of true of us losing any one creature. If we drop to eight creatures on board instead of nine, we lose the biggest buff. So protecting Jetmere exclusively doesn't actually 100% save things. Plus, if folks are going to instant speed remove Jetmere on the turn that we play him, they'll probably do it in response to us moving to equip the Greaves anyway. Greaves are obviously amazing, but in this specific deck, they do feel just a teensy bit superfluous. That's all. Then there's Impact Tremors, which I actually really love, and this deck even contains the big bro Perforos too. I like the Perforos as another potential angle of attack, but Impact Tremors just felt, well, if you'll forgive the pun, low impact to me. I just felt as though if we used this card slot on a card that instead made a bunch more tokens, then Jetmere's damage output would be a lot bigger, and that felt like a more useful avenue to pursue. And that actually brings me to my two biggest cuts, Beastmaster Ascension and Elish Norn. I just don't think the deck needs them. This deck also contains a Craterhoof Behemoth, and to be frank, I was iffy on that one too. 
I will keep the hoof. I think it's fine to have another one of these types of pumps as a backup so that the pressure isn't 100% on Jetmir. But in general, I just found that Jetmir does the pumping up job so well that the deck didn't really need too many other redundancy effects to help out in that arena. What it needed most was more bodies on board to hit that nine creature threshold and trounce enemies to bits. After all, every additional body on the battlefield is at least eight more damage for our big blowout turn. So when it comes to the pump, I just didn't feel like these were necessary to pursue. So let's get to business. Time to add a bunch of token makers. First up, I'd like Hanwar Garrison to join his friends Krenko and the Hero of Bladehold. I use this Garrison in my Martin Stromgold deck and it puts in work. Getting one of these into play early, especially if we get it into play on turn two because we played it off of a Mana Dork, absolutely sets our deck up to succeed as soon as possible. I also noticed both Tendershoot Dryad and Dragon Layer Spider making tokens basically every turn, so how about the lovely Wolverine Riders joins them? If left unchecked, any one of these will take over the entire game on their own. All right, now I absolutely have to shout out two of my favorite new Capenna cards that need to get themselves into this deck yesterday. Grand Crescendo and Rabble Rousing, eat your heart out. Y'all, these cards are incredible. Instant speed tokens and or protection for the army, A+. Attacking that also doubles up the number of creatures we're attacking with, 10 out of 10, absolute stomp. I'm totally putting these into my token decks, and Jetmir should do that too. And finally, the ultimate inclusion this deck 100% ought to play, get Nakatl Warpride into your Jetmir decks, folks. Attacking with this creature produces a token for every creature the defending player controls. It, this will hit that 9 creature threshold all by itself all at once. If this card sticks in play, it is certainly GG. I cannot recommend it enough. And that's it for the official swaps, but before we get to the budget section, here are some higher cost honorable mentions if you're making Jetmir's party even more luxuriant. First, some 4 mana white creatures. Leonin Warleader and Benny Brax are perfect upgrades for this deck. More tokens, more cards, more fun. I'll also shout out Grand Abolisher too. If this deck follows the model of playing Jetmir for the big final blowout, then protecting ourselves from instant speed removal and especially fog effects is absolutely key. When upgrading to a higher budget, I strongly, strongly encourage playing Grand Abolisher effects. I'll also shout out Field of the Dead if you happen to pursue even more landfall token makers for your deck, and remember to mix up your regular basics and your snow basics if you do to get more land names to trigger the Field of the Dead faster. I'm probably a broken record about this little trick by now, I know I've shouted it out in way too many of these videos, but whatever, it's really heckin' cool and Field of the Dead is a dang strong card. Seek also to amp up the card draw by the way. Sylvan Library is a known powerhouse and it doesn't depend upon our board state to help us draw, which this deck really loves because our board state is the thing that we most need to protect. And finally, my favorite card to add to this deck would be Arachnogenesis. Oh, were you attacking me because my board was empty and I looked completely defenseless? Nah, turns out you actually just handed me the game. I'll play Jetmir next turn and crack back for like 80 damage. This is such a hugely powerful fog and it is perfect for our party. Woof, that was a lot, but you know what? We're not actually done yet because we have a full part two to get through. Let's talk about budget. All right, I'm kind of nervous about saying this next part, and I may word it poorly, so apologies in advance if I do, but I made two deck lists for this video, the regular and the budget version, which is coming up, and when I was playtesting and messing around with the decks, I kind of found that I think I prefer playing the budget version. There are aspects to a deck strategy that can shift around when the budget changes, especially if it changes dramatically. and. In this case, I just kind of found that I was a bit more entertained by some of those more off-the-wall choices. I, I think especially a big factor is that when a deck is suited up with a lot of those expensive staple-type cards, maybe sometimes opponents also know what to expect a little bit more from that type of deck. So in this case, I'm just really excited to highlight some of those inexpensive cards that really take opponents by surprise. For this, we're cutting anything that costs over 10 bucks. Crater Hoofs, out. Esper Sentinels, gone. Birds, Perforos, Iroas, Parallel Lives, Sayonara. This also hits our land base too, because there are some very expensive lands here. Overall, we're cutting over 20 cards and saving hundreds upon hundreds of dollars. So that just means we have some reclaiming to do. Let's start with the lands. I'm gonna go with some regular budget standbys, but while I'm here, I'll also add in a few extra lands. 
The original deck contained all of the expensive fetch lands, and I just think it's nice to replace them with the budget ones, so we can still get some bonus landfall payoffs here and there. After the lands, it's important to note that we lost a lot of our card draw in the budget culling, and it's very important for us to replace those. Rite of Harmony jumps out to me as a great card for token decks to potentially get a quick burst of cards, especially off of any of our creatures that make a bunch of tokens whenever they attack. The deck also includes a Shamanic Revelation as well, so I think I'll add in a Camaraderie to go with it. These draw spells based off of our number of creatures are especially useful when we're right in that stage of having like five things in play, so we don't want to cast Jetmir just yet, but we also don't want to be stuck top decking for the rest of the game either. Oh, and you know, I think I'll also add in the simple little reckless impulse. I just really like diversifying our card draw so that it's not always dependent upon what we have in play to be useful. In fact, that's also why I'm going to add in a Sunbird's Invocation here too. This is just a really strong advantage engine. These cards help grease the wheels in small and in really big ways, and that's just a great thing for us to have. Importantly, this deck no longer contains a heroic intervention, so to make up for that, how about we get a simple Rootborn Defenses in here? Classic token deck savior right here, you know? Alright, now onto the token makers themselves. Combat Calligrapher almost passed me by, but the more I look at it, the more and more I'm falling in love. It gives stuff to our enemies, sure, but we don't actually care about that because they can't hit us back and Jetmir gives us trample anyway. And if we attack multiple opponents, we get more and more of those inkling tokens. Excellent stuff, friend. Since we already had Rabble Rousing, how about we also add in Indulge to Excess? Every time we attack, boom, more bodies. We'll ideally want to play this card on the same turn that we cast Jetmir, which can be a bit of a mana investment, so do be careful with your timing. But if it works out, it could just end the game on the spot. I waffled on this next one, because I know it's a lot of mana, but I do assume this more budget deck is operating just a little more slowly than the previous list, so I'm comfortable adding in another 8 mana card here, especially because that card is Azuri's Predation. Need a board to come out of nowhere? This spell has you covered. It's a board wipe, and it immediately sets us up for Jetmir's arrival. D yeah, I'll take it, that's amazing. Speaking of which, can we get the Myosian in here, please? This card is just incredible. It's indestructible until we want to use that ability, and that ability will give us a minimum of 10 creatures. And genuinely, that's my conservative estimate. This card sets Jetnir up beautifully. Give it a try as an astonishing late game serve. All right, this next one's a little bit left field, but I think this deck wants to play Curious Herd, especially with all of the treasure and clue and food tokens that people are making these days. Like, when Jetmir casts this card, you'd better bust your treasures immediately, or else he's gonna make like 10 beasts. I'd normally prefer to destroy everyone else's artifacts rather than making tokens off of them, but Jetmir takes those tokens and basically immediately turns them lethal on the very next turn. So in this case, the best artifact removal is actually player removal. And for our final addition, it's nothing new, but I have to plug Naya Charm again, y'all. This is my favorite modal spell in the entire game. And I'm not, I genuinely am not saying that as an exaggeration. This card rules. The new Cabaretti charm, it's nice, but it just does not come close to how much I love Naya charm. Pick something off with damage? Yeah, it's a nice utility. Get back a dead card? Okay, that's actually awesome. Heck, you can even let someone else get back a card for a political deal. And you can tap things down. You can tap down an army that's about to hit you. You can tap down blockers that would get in your way. You can even tap down someone else's blockers when they're being attacked by a different player. This card's applications are endless. It's so political. It's so amazing. If we're playing a Naya deck, I just have to shout out this all-time classic and bring a little charm to the party. Oh, and by the way, here's one final bonus. I had mentioned earlier that if I were to build Jetmir for myself, I'd personally want to go for a more land-based deck. And here is why. Sylvan Awakening, Kamal's Will, and plenty more. I just think it sounds rad to use a landfall to make a bunch of creatures, but then turn tons and tons of lands into creatures too, from out of nowhere, and just have a grand old time. Just something to think about. Whew, okay, this party is done. Which means now it's time for the after party, but we're gonna bounce for now. You can find a link to both deck lists in the description below with the cuts in the maybe board. I hope you had a great revel, and if you have any other party favors or recommendations that you'd like to make for your fellow Jetmere players, make sure you leave your suggestions down in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching.